Uh, first of all, thank you, Marion, and everyone else who's been involved in putting on uh, YAPSI EU this year. So far, it's been great. I've been having a good time. The talks have been wonderful. So thank you very much. Been very happy. And you guys were really slow on the clapping cue on that one. <laughs> So, in case you're ever curious what happens uh, in a corporation, big business, when I go in there and I uh, give a training about something, this is actually an extraction of a much longer day-long training called Agile Companies Go Pop that I give. Uh, and it's very fun because uh, this is, I've modified it slightly for this keynote, but at the end of this presentation that I'm giving them as part of my training, invariably someone holds up their hands and says, did you just recommend that all of us in this room get fired? <laughs> so, so, the answer is no. But you'll understand why there's a little bit of confusion, which happens after I start talking about some of the background. <clears throat> so you are killing managers. We as a community are doing this. This is actually a good thing. And I want to explain some of this, what's going on. But first of all, why aren't I talking about Pearl? This is a keynote. End of day one, why aren't I talking about Pearl at a Pearl conference? You've been hearing Perl all day long. You've been talking to other Perl developers. Tomorrow, Matt's going to be talking about the state of Velociraptor. The day after that, Sawyer X is going to be talking about the joy in what we do. You're going to be hearing a lot about Perl. So I want to. I like to go a little bit further. Since I've got a keynote, I've kind of got a captive audience now, so I can play around a little bit more. And what I want to do is I want to inspire you. I want you to start thinking about other things that you can do that you've never thought of before. But I need to give you some background here. So in 2012, Forbes published this article, The Best Kept Management Secret on the Planet, Agile. Now, just a quick show of hands. How many of you in 2012 heard of Agile? <laughs> How in the world is this the best kept management secret on the planet? We've heard about bubbles before. We are in a bubble, the tech industry. The new tech industry, not the old tech industry, us. We're in a bubble, and people aren't really seeing in too much. But we're kind of leading the way in a number of things. So our new tech industry, which is really largely born by the internet and what's possible there, we have to move very fast. We have to adjust to a changing environment that we don't know the ground that we're on. And we're not necessarily iconoclastic because we're rebels. We're iconoclastic, we break the rules because we have no choice, because we don't even know what the rules are in this new game. We, not just Perl, but tech in general, particularly that involved in agile, we're part of the new way of doing business versus old school. You have old school thinkers who think that Amazon.com has become one of the most powerful companies on the planet because they put a web front end on a bookstore. If that is what you believe, then you're part of the old school. The new school is completely different, and the rules are changing. And a lot of what I'm talking about here is happening on a very small scale, but it's beginning to bubble out. We're beginning to see it a little bit more. And it's going to be rather interesting, because a lot of the stuff is going to challenge you in interesting ways. It'll challenge your preconceptions about things. Um, but I want to talk about management in specific, because this is one of the things that companies keep asking me about. How do we handle management in Agile? And in fact, I had one company last year, they said, we want you to really dig in here, because we've had other agile consultants come in before, and they don't talk about management. They kind of fumble the ball. And part of that is because Scrum's dominated so much of agile today. And Scrum talks about the product owner, the Scrum master, the team, and it doesn't talk about management. It's not that Scrum is anti-management, it's that that's kind of outside the purview of what it's trying to do. They're trying to look at things at a smaller team level. So in order to understand the differences in management and what's going on and how we're helping to destroy management as we know it, we need to get some history. A long time ago, the earliest societies that we can conceive of are what we called hunter-gatherers. You had to follow the leader or die. There wasn't a lot of hierarchy there because there was no room for hierarchy. There wasn't really an idea of class consciousness or anything. And it was, they were often very egalitarian. Men and women had different roles, but they were considered to be equals in society. Really nice. It's a, it's a nice idea. There's a lot of controversy about exactly what that meant. But that, that's, that's a very simplistic thing. If we want to fast forward a few thousand years, we get to the feudal era. 
If you're familiar with feudal history, like many things in this talk, this is going to be a grotesque oversimplification, but it shows the broad outlines of what we're talking about. And when I talk about the feudal era, in this case, I specifically picked uh, England post-Reformation after Henry VIII to kind of pull the Catholic Church out of the picture because it makes it a little bit simpler. At the top, you have the king. You have the dukes underneath the king. You have the barons underneath the dukes. You have the knights underneath the dukes. You have the serfs underneath the knights. Sort of, more or less. That was a hierarchy that we tended to have in the feudal era. And the interesting thing is, if you were in this structure, you didn't think to question your position because this was all you knew. Now let's, let's fast forward a little bit to the modern corporate era. <laughs> now a few of you who had a particularly keen eye may have noticed that this structure is relatively similar. I might add, I'm not the first person to notice the similarities <clears throat> between feudal style societies and the corporate structures. <clears throat> But I'm, I think I'm one of the first people to kind of tie this into the idea of management disappearing. And we'll see more about that later. Now, the interesting thing about the corporate structure, you can see it's like identical to the feudal structure. And if you're in the corporate structure, you, you don't think to question your role as a developer or manager because this is all you know. The larger the corporations, the more likely this is to happen. This is what you know. This is what you expect. Um, and Ricardo Semler, we'll talk about him a little bit more. He had a really interesting description of uh, one company where he talked about a textile company, corporation, where you had 10 workers sitting at looms. For every 10 workers, you had an overseer. For every 10 overseers, you had a manager. And you know, above that, you, know, you had the CEO or the owner. Very much like the structure. The interesting thing was he was talking about a company which existed about 400 years ago. In four centuries, we haven't been able to break the grip of this hierarchical structure. We haven't known how. We've just assumed that this is the way things are. We went from this on the big scale with feudal societies down to the small scales of corporate, corporate uh, organization. And how do we get there? Many of you have worked for a startup. You've got a boss. You've got a few developers. Things start to get a little bit more complicated. So you get some teams. And then you have managers running the teams. The boss has become the owner of the company. He's a little bit more distanced from the uh, teams, you don't see them as much, and then you have a mature company where you have this middle layer of management which is often a little bit jumbled there, but it starts to grow larger, and then eventually you get down to the feudalism 2.0 where we've replicated the old structures that we had where people just don't question their role because this is the way things are supposed to be, isn't it? And then some companies realize, well, you know, we're, we're having some difficulties here. We're not, we're not getting as innovative as we should be. We're not doing as much as we could be. How do we compete against those startups? So progressive companies have an innovation team over here, reporting directly to a director. <laughs> Their job is to come up with brilliant new ideas and not tell the rest of the company about them. <laughs> so feudal inefficiencies. Feudal societies did not view themselves as inefficient because this was all they knew. But you had local allegiances. For example, you worked on a serf on the manor that a lord oversaw. You didn't see the other manors. You didn't write to your cousin in the town over because A, you couldn't write. And B, you probably never traveled to that town in the first place. You, you might even not even know about that cousin. You probably didn't see a duke or a baron. Seeing a king would be a once in a lifetime deal, a very big thing. It, it just didn't happen. So allegiances in feudal societies tended to be very local, which makes for fantastic historical novels, I might add. Because when you read about Macbeth, why did all the soldiers follow Macbeth? Because this hierarchical structure encourages, <laughs> encourages you to follow the person directly above you because you had those local allegiances. They didn't have a lot of communication across feudal societies. The modern idea of mail pretty much didn't exist a long time ago. You didn't have price signals in those societies because you didn't sell the goods to the lord of the manor. Power flowed down, goods and services flowed up. You gave the lord of the manor your goods and services. By the way, when I say you gave those goods and services, it's because all of us would have been serfs. That was the vast majority of history. We don't read about them. They're forgotten about. We read about the kings, the queens, the dukes, and the barons, the serfs. That's what we really would have been by the law of averages. We would have been giving our goods and services to the Lord and keeping whatever little bits left over for ourselves. And they had no internal markets. They, they had merchants. 
but they didn't really have good, you know, strong price signals. They didn't have supply and demand. A merchant might buy something far away and just keep traveling along until he could sell his goods and services, or his goods. And then services, you know, itinerant nights, stuff like that. It wasn't a very efficient society, and it was command and control from king to serf. And again, no one questioned this because that's all they knew. They were that frog in the boiling water that we keep hearing about. But actually, corporations have some inefficiencies. So <clears throat> your team, you're on your team, and you, you have a little bit more communication with the other teams, but you tend to be loyal to your team. You know, the mailroom personnel, they don't hang out with the directors. The CEO probably doesn't come around and pal around with you a lot. You're, you're local to your team. Other teams are local to their teams. Groups are lo loyal to their groups. You know, it's HR versus IT all the time. Um, because allegiances tend to be local, even in corporations. You had poor commu internal communication. You had no price signals. If that team over there could sell you an XML feed of data cheaper than that team over there, that doesn't happen. Because that team over there is the one responsible for producing that data, because that's what they're told to do. You don't get a choice about this. You had no internal markets. You, you don't have a free movement of labor. You don't have a DBA saying, screw this, I want to be in HR. It doesn't happen within corporations very much. And it was command and control from the CEO down to the lowest person in the organization. By lowest, I mean that's how they tend to rake themselves. This is how the class hierarchy starts setting up in these corporations. In a feudal society, you had births and deaths. In a corporation, you have hiring and firing. In a feudal society, if you kept bad-mouthing the king, off with your head. In a corporation, you keep bad-mouthing the CEO, you get a pink slip. To a large extent, modern corporations, and there are differences, modern corporations are like feudal societies sped up by about an order of magnitude. And they go to war with other corporations, they declare peace treaties with other corporations, And why do corporations struggle? We know a lot about the struggle of corporations. We talk about this a lot. And people keep speculating, why is it the corporations struggle? And when I say corporations, the bigger they are, the more they tend to get mired in this mess. And one of my favorites is when IBM, in their core values, decided to remove the word fun, which kind of summed up so much of what's going on with this. <laughs> so why do they struggle? We talk about this a lot. It's well known. This struggle tends to happen more in the internet age because things are moving so much faster that disruptive startups can come along and innovate in a way that big corporations can't. And then I discovered this fascinating paper which really nailed it. This is relatively recent, The Dark Side of Analyst Coverage, The Case of Innovation. What they did was they started studying analyst coverage of public corporations. If you're not familiar with the term, public corporation is one where the public can buy and sell shares within the corporation. So share prices in these corporations are tied to compensation. The higher up in the hierarchy you go, the more likely it is you're going to get shares in that company. So you want to keep the share prices high in order to ensure that you get more money. Share prices are tied to job security, because if they drop too low, the board's going to start firing people. In fact, share prices are tied to company security, the existence of the company. You could be a valuable company, your share prices drop too low, Company's gone. Hostile takeover. You get bought out. They start shutting down the divisions they think are unprofitable. Share prices are seen as a measure of success for large public corporations. You need to keep share prices high, but that means you have to minimize risk. Because the more risk you take on, the more the public doesn't understand what's happening, and the more they get scared. So when they don't understand what's happening, when you're taking those risks, your share prices drop which means the value of your corporation drops, which is very dangerous. Minimizing risk means minimizing innovation, and this is the core problem. It is particularly core for public corporations because they have the analyst coverage. Minimizing risk is a short-term strategy. Innovating is a long-term strategy. Anyone see a little tension between those two? It's a big problem for public corporations. They're having this a lot. In fact, when Amazon first turned a profit, Amazon was famous for years about, oh my goodness, look at them, they're never turning a profit, we can't invest in them, and you know, investors were confused, should we or should we not? They're getting a lot of revenue, but they're not turning a profit. When they first did, Jeff Bezos said, oops, we didn't mean to. He wanted to keep reinvesting and innovating in Amazon to grow more and more, and we see today 
that Amazon's managed to turn cloud con computing into a utility where you need extra clouds, you need extra computing services, you just go out to Amazon and buy it. Jeff Bezos gets it. Amazon gets it. Amazon's got a lot of other problems along those lines, but they understand the innovation problem. So all of this, and believe me, I am getting to a point here. <clears throat> all of this raises a very fascinating philosophical question. One of the most important ones I think there is. Now, if we are willing to fight and die for democracy and capitalism, why do we forbid this in the very corporations that we are supporting? It's a very interesting question. I've heard many answers to this. So inside of a modern corporation, you have some interesting problems. Uh, you know, why do people bother? Why, where would innovation be coming from? Well, first of all, you have little personal incentive many times. I know of a gentleman for a company, he conceived of a new feature. He implemented it and he released it, and it quickly became apparent to the company they were going to net millions of euros a year off of this individual single-handed work. In order to thank him, his boss took him to a pub and bought him a beer. <laughs> Just a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever worked at a job where you feel that you're underpaid relative to the value that you have provided to that company? Oh, don't be shy. Yeah, I see a few hands out there. You know this happens. Large corporations, they're not there for your interest. The saying goes that you're not gonna get rich working for someone else. You can also be risk averse. Hide and seek is a very common strategy played. The larger the corporate graph, the more likely it is to happen. In order to keep your job and maybe even get ahead, you don't have to do well, you just have to not do poorly. If you don't screw up on a large corporate graph, they are less likely to notice you, so you keep your job. Blame avoidance, this is a tough one. Once you start getting higher up there and you start making the shots, you start calling the shots, what happens then? Oh, well, we've got this huge project. This project is going disastrously, but several high-up people have si si signed off on this project. No one wants to pull the trigger because the bullet might bounce back and hit them. People are afraid of that. When they do take the risks, they're in it, all or nothing. They forget about sunk costs because it's dangerous to them personally. And you also have groupthink, which is a common problem. You get inside of a corporation, how many of you ever worked at a job and you know, your first few weeks there, oh, I wanna change this, I wanna change this, I wanna change this. Several months later, you don't notice it anymore. You're used to it, you've become complacent because we don't question our role there, we just get used to it. So given all this, and I know some of this is very controversial to many folks, why do feudal corporations exist? Now this challenge is largely happening the problems are happening, again, largely because of the internet speed, which is coming up. How new companies are coming up, they're being very disruptive. So this is a newer problem which is happening. But feudal corporations <clears throat> have several interesting things about them. By the way, in uh, 1924, uh, the computing recording tabulating company changed their name to International Business Machines, and that was their brand new modern 1924 logo. They're now known as IBM, to most of you. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. They have brand recognition. Uh, they have very mature products. Um, I'm sorry people keep asking me, you know, why do I use PowerPoint? Why do I use Microsoft Office products? Because all of the competition falls down in some way or another when I'm trying to exchange documents with a lot of other companies. Microsoft has mature products. I'm not saying I like them, but I'm saying they do have mature products. And they also have deep financial pockets quite often. Or if they don't, but the company's seen as having value, they have access to financial resources that smaller companies don't. So they have a lot of advantages that smaller disruptive companies can't. But they're recognizing this problem. It's being talked about more and more, the issues they have. So what do they do to compete? So BBC has a blue room. In the White City building, the BBC, they have this room you can walk by and you can see them playing around with like Wii controllers and other things, new ideas that they're coming up with and playing around with. Uh, I don't know how much actually comes out of that blue room, but this is one of the things that companies do. They create that little innovation team, and sometimes it produces results, sometimes it doesn't. Other times companies are funding startups. And they're saying, we know we can't innovate, we're gonna go ahead and fund you, and we're gonna get free licenses to everything you produce, or we're gonna own a percentage of your company, or any way of trying to create an innovative environment. Or they might resort to litigation. Hi, I think the courts are gonna protect my business model, because that's what we do in a laissez-faire capitalist society, right? So uh, the RIAA is probably the most famous example of this. 
But this is what I really want to talk about. All of that was background for an interesting development we're seeing more and more of. When I say managerless, I don't necessarily mean entirely managerless. What I tend to mean is, so you have the upper level, you've got like the CEO, you've got the board, and you've got the local teams, I mean the team leads, and you've got this huge layer of middle management in there. And a lot of newer companies are saying, you know, that kind of sucks. We want people who produce. We want people who make stuff and build us value, not people who are shuffling papers. If you're in that layer of middle management, I apologize if this sounds challenging to you, but this is happening more and more. So Basecamp, formerly known as 37 Signals, uh, they're named now after their most popular product, their most profitable product, Basecamp. They produce high rise campfire, campfire uh, Ruby on Rails, you've probably heard of that. Uh, they tend to be between 35 and 40 employees. They try many, many interesting strategies to try and uh, make their company more productive. They have primarily self-organizing teams. That's the crux of a lot of this. People ask, if we have self-organizing teams, why do we need managers? And they're reluctantly trying a middle management role. Mm, I don't know if that's going to stick or not, but they're trying to figure out different ways of not having management. GitHub, 200 plus employees, self-organizing teams, also reluctantly trying a middle management role, but they don't want it. They're fighting against it. You see these startups coming out and saying, no, we don't want this anymore. We don't want the old way of doing things. And then, bam, Valve. Wow, if there is a fascinating company to read about, it is Valve Software. So they're more than 250 people. They have better profits per employee than Google, Apple, and I think Microsoft. No, Amazon, sorry. Um, <clears throat> they almost look like the platonic ideal of agile internally, but that's not really true. And this last thing, uh, what are corporations for? I know you can't actually read this URL, but if you Google Valve Software, what are corporations for? They hired an economist at one point to manage the economy of a lot of their games, and he brought up some of these similarities between corporations and feudal societies, and started asking some very challenging questions, um, and started con comparing and contrasting them with what Valve does internally. Now, first of all, if you're not familiar with Valve, if you're one of the two people in this room who's not heard of them, They've produced the Half-Life series, the Counter-Strike series, the Team Fortress series, Portal series, Left 4 Dead series, and the Steam Engine. Massively popular, massively profitable games. I mean, they are just rolling in cash right now. They're entirely self-funded. Like, that means they're not a public corporation. I was talking about that earlier. Many of the companies I'm talking about today are self-funded. They are not public. They own all their intellectual property. In fact, they went through a huge battle to buy back all of their intellectual property. And Gabe Newell, the founder of the company, says, hiring well is the most important thing in the universe. Nothing else comes close. Um, instead of building people up to be a good fit within this company, they just try and hire people who already are. And what do they do? They have no managers at all. How do you build something that big and complex in all those games and replicate the success again and again and again without managers. Well, for one thing, they also have no job titles. Uh, asterisk, because it's not entirely true, they tend to put job titles on their business cards because they discovered it freaks people out if you hand them a business card without a job title. <laughs> Everybody is an expert. Most people in this room, including myself, would never get hired by Valve because they're very, very picky about who they pick. You've heard of Google's 20% time? Valve is 100% time. Your first day of work, you show up. What do I work on? Figure it out. <laughs> Go around, talk to the different teams, find out which one's interesting to you, which one do you think you can add value to, which one do you think can add value to the company, and do what you want. All of their desks have wheels. In fact, they've talked about making this the symbol of their company. The idea is, if you decide the team you're on isn't profitable, isn't producing something which is good, Talk to other teams. I think I'm going to work for that team instead. You tell your old team, sorry, this ain't working for me. You unplug your network cable, you unplug your computer, you wheel your desk over to your new team. You are encouraged to do this. And it's not that you have to stay a programmer. They have programmers working on story design. They have people they can get into HR if they want to. They can play around with that. They can get in hiring if they want to do that. They do have leads for projects, but these leads kind of just emerge naturally out of their talking and here's what we're going to do. So you can move anywhere and do anything within the organization. And they encourage this. They encourage people to learn more. And all evaluation is by your peers, because you have no management. So 
absolutely fascinating what they're doing. Uh, they do have some internal problems, but I'm, I'm not really going to go into that right now. Uh, but I do encourage you to uh, Google the new employee handbook. This was originally leaked. And then Valve eventually said, yeah, this is us. Um, this is every manager's nightmare and every employee's fantasy. It describes how they work internally, and it's fascinating. It is just absolutely fascinating, the things that they do, because it's simply nothing like the traditional structure that we have. But what I've been talking about up here is a bunch of newer and you know, somewhat smaller companies. Some would argue these companies can be smaller because they don't have all the management overhead. But the reality is this isn't a new thing. High tech is a catalyst for this. No, I'm not talking about the web framework. The metaphor, the chemistry metaphor, is a catalyst to something which doesn't make a chemical process happen. It simply speeds it up tremendously. Processes which could take hundreds of years could take minutes or even seconds with a proper catalyst. High tech is the catalyst. It is what is pushing this forward. The modern internet age is issuing in this interesting transformation we're beginning to see, but it's happened long before. Ricardo Semler, uh, this is actually a manufacturing company, over 3,000 employees. Uh, depending upon who you talk to, their average growth is between 24 to 27% for 25 years. If you're wondering what that means, compound interest means you start out with a million dollars, you'll have a quarter billion at the end of that. That's a lot. Um, <clears throat> his very first day on the job, he told his father he was going to quit. He didn't want to work for their command and control structure. And his father, rather than allowing his son to quit the company business, said, OK, I quit. You take it. His first day on the job, he fired 60% of upper management, got rid of several of the management tiers, eliminated all secretarial positions, had no negative financial impact on the company. <laughs> it is amazing what he's been doing. He's been working for over two decades now. By the way, he recently celebrated 10 years of owning the company and not making a single decision. They do have an upper board. Um, I think it's like, I think it's four people on the board. And the CEO rotates between each of them every six months. And <clears throat> the employees, they vote for their manager. So they do have managers, but it's all vote. It's a democracy thing. Uh, you can choose your own salary. And that sounds crazy. Why would you choose your own salary? If I choose to have a million dollars a year, well, I've got to convince one of the teams inside that I'm worth it. Because they're going to evaluate me, not managers. If I say, I'm worth more than this, and I can convince the team, fine, do it. There's a lot of fascinating things about Semco. Um, I would highly recommend uh, Leading by a Mission. That's a speech they gave at, uh, MIT. he gave at MIT. You can Google it. It's an hour long. Very fascinating reading, or listening, sorry. And their three values for Semco are democracy. Everyone gets a vote. If they're going to open up a new plant somewhere, the employees vote on whether or not this is a good idea. Profit sharing, everyone in the company gets to take part. Please keep in mind, 24 to 27% annual growth for 25 bloody years. This is actually working. Transparency is also another one. So annual report is released by your company, and you probably can't read that annual report. Most of us don't understand what it means. Every employee in Semco is offered the opportunity to learn how to read their annual report so they can make better voting decisions on how the company runs. They have less than 1% annual turnover, and they're routinely rated the best company in Brazil to work for. They are phenomenal. Other companies, Morningstar Foods started in 1960. 72, I think, in the 1970s. They produced 40% of the United States pureed and chopped tomatoes. Uh, the owner of the company said, well, you know, we've got a, long, a lot of long-haul truck drivers. What do they need with a manager? So they've just been managerless for decades now. W.L. Gore and Associates, they're one of the largest textile chemistry companies in the world. You may have heard of Gore-Tex. They were formed in the 1950s. They don't have managers. Zappos, uh, medium.com, a couple, couple of very fascinating companies. They've adopted something called holacracy, which isn't entirely non-managerless, but it's a completely different way of structuring a company where you adopt a constitution for the company and you guarantee rights to your employees. Who would do something that stupid? But it's working. <clears throat> so getting back to agile, managers are process. Workers produce. Since Agile favors products over process, it has to favor workers over managers. But 
Not everything in a company should be run in an agile way. Um, just look at the military. You're not going to have sprints and daily stand-ups in the military. <laughs> you don't want democracy in the military. You don't want to order soldiers to char up a, charge up a hill and have them vote on whether or not they're going to stay alive. <laughs> there's a lot of things like, there's a lot of places where maybe this does not work. We don't know what it all means yet. But managerless companies, the things we're seeing is they're usually agile or lean companies. They're usually tech companies, but not always. Some of the ones I mentioned definitely were not. Uh, they're usually privately funded, because when you're a privately funded company, you don't get that huge wave of money from people buying your stocks, but now you can take risks because you're not beholden to those other people. So there are some things we just don't know about this. We don't know if these companies can succeed long term. We're seeing some interesting outliers here. We're seeing Semco in Brazil. I mean, they're just doing phenomenally. I think uh, last I saw, they were $210 million a year. Um, very profitable. Much of that profitable goes directly back to their employees, by the way. Uh, many of their employees, uh, if they decide, you know, I think we should go into this area of business, they convince other team members to do it, and they can do it. They have competitors working for them because Ricardo Semler says, I don't care. Let them. They're going to be too freaked out by this lack of management style anyway. There's not much they can take from it. But if they do, it makes the world a better place. <clears throat> so other things, you know, what social changes might this entail? What if this keeps happening? Can you imagine you work for a managerless company where you get to vote on what happens, where you get to choose what you do, where so long as you provide value, you will be rewarded appropriately, and then you have a surf working for another company? <laughs> yes which has all of its own things, a part of the reason why I'm self-employed right now. Who knows? That might not last, but um, there's some interesting social changes which might happen as a result of this, if this keeps going. We just don't know, but it's just so fascinating to me. We don't know where managers are required. Some places they are. Like I said, the US military, or any military system, that's a great example of it. We don't know what best practices are for this because it's a completely new field. It looks like it's fairly profitable for the companies that are doing this. And it looks fair. It looks like a nice thing. It's beginning to challenge the age-old notion of how we have to do business, but we don't know how it works. Holacracy is, you can go out to holacracy.com. I know the name sounds kind of woo-woo, it gives me the creeps. But they're actually codifying, they've written up a constitution that companies can adopt for their own method of rethinking how business is run. And we're the ones doing this. Most of us, or well, many of us, we're part of this new technology movement, which is moving much faster, which is moving into agile, which is challenging the old way of doing things. And we're making things more fair as a result. I think it's wonderful watching these companies, listening to employees at you know, Zappos or Semco and other places talk about how wonderful it is that they can actually make their decisions. Because it turns out, when you treat people like adults, sometimes they act like them. So, corporations, a lot of similarities to feudalism. I like to think of it as feudalism 2.0. Um, agile, we know, reduces the need for middle management, but we don't know how far down the rabbit hole that goes. We don't know what the future holds for this, but we're seeing a fascinating change in business, which is happening more and more. In fact, oh, one of my clients, when I gave my full Agile Companies Go Pop training, I talked to them about a year later, and I asked them how it was going, and uh, one of the people said, well, actually, you know, a couple of management positions, you know, there was kind of a smallish company. A couple of management positions, we just, after the person stepped down, we just didn't fill it. Didn't make a difference. <laughs> if you empower people to be able to make those decisions, because no one wants to take a decision which is just going to cause their company to fail. They're actually going to think about these things if you let them. So it's a great way of doing things. It's very interesting. I don't know if it is, it's a fair way of doing things. But I don't know if it's going to be profitable for everyone. But that's just what I wanted to bring to you. It's a totally different way of doing business. We don't know what it means, but I think it's really fascinating. And I encourage all of you to start reading about Ricardo Semler, Holacracy, and other ways of doing business today, because it is more fair and it's wonderful. <laughs> well, I, I assume that I actually have more time than I thought. So since I'm keen on breaking the rules, uh, generally keynotes, you know, you give your talk, they applaud, you go away. But if anyone wants to ask questions, I am more than happy to take a few. Yes? Why do you think that uh, military managers run 
I'm sorry. I might know as an individual that it is better for society, for the goals of the military, for me to charge and take that hill, which is heavily fortified. I might know that I have an 80% chance of dying to do that. Yeah, I might vote in my own self-interest instead of taking that hill. The needs there conflict. Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm a coward. I'll admit it. I'm. That that would be an interesting thing, but uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yes. What's that? Um, it varies from company to company because we don't know the practice, best practices here. The question was, who gets fired if someone doesn't do anything? Um, many of these companies have evaluation by your peers, and you have an annual evaluation or maybe a six-month evaluation. And what happens is the, the, your peers say, they actually didn't do anything. We don't want to rehire them. And they get let go. So in this case, you can't play hide and seek. It doesn't matter how big the company gets. You can't just try and get by. You actually have to do enough work to convince those who know your job best that you're actually of value to the company. Uh, could there also be mini groups like local allegiances, as you call them, between the peers based on other parameters other than performance? Um, could, uh, you said, could there be mini groups based upon parameters? Well, based upon Thank other you. things than, a peer, uh, than a performance. Um, like you're saying that the peers. Like the will area judge. that they might be working in and stuff like, like that? Several peers would get together for their own self interest. Uh, working against them. Uh, uh, colluding. Yes. colluding. Uh, the question is, you know, can there be collusion in this? I have never heard of this. I have, I, yes, the idea sounds reasonable that potentially there could be collusion. And Valve actually has an interesting case where some of the newer employees claim that even though they're not managerless, some of the people who have been around for a long time have an undue amount of influence. So that, I don't know if that's collusion per se or if you just don't want to fire your buddy there. So I don't know. But it is something we just don't know well yet. By the way, how much time do I have? OK, any more questions? Can you talk a little bit about the dysfunction at Valve, maybe at a high level? Could someone hold up their hand? Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can, I Can you talk about the dysfunction at Valve, maybe at a high level? OK, you won't see this, but I have a hidden slide there where I had several of the notes. I was worried about my time, which obviously I shouldn't have been. Uh, so. Yes, Valve has a number of alleged struggles. Uh, one, they're not always as flat as they appear. Employees have been there for a long time. There are rumors that they have a disproportionate amount of influence over the process. They've also discovered that because they're so incredibly financially successful that those financial incentives kind of kill, or their financial reserves kind of kill their incentive to do new stuff because they're sitting on a ton of money. I mean, they are just phenomenally wealthy. So they're so successful, it's hurting them in some ways. They also have problems with Windows lock-in, uh, which I'm sure many of you have heard they're tries to get out of that. They're trying to break away from that. But they've got themselves tied to a very rigid segment of the market. And I know with Windows 8 was very much a challenge for them. Um, so they need to be able to find a way of diversifying beyond that. They're not you know, too narrow of an ecosystem in order to survive in. Uh, they also have problems with mentoring new employees. They're not good at communicating information internally. Uh, they've actually tried to do some work recently with uh, hiring some interns, I think it was, trying to figure out better ways of sharing this information because it is hard to get up to speed in Valve. So let's, let's just feel the problems that they're fa facing right now. So the, the question I have about Valve is if, if everybody's voting by moving their desk to the group they want to work in, very often the group, or it, it seems like the group they want to work in may not actually be what's best for the company. Uh, so, so what is the check and balance to, to make sure that that product gets out the door and, and they're not working on something that has absolutely no value? Okay, so there's a couple of interesting things. One, the product getting out the door, that's another problem they have. There's something in the industry known as valve time. Uh, <laughs> their complete inability to deliver things on a, in a predictable manner. It takes them a long time to deliver stuff. Um, what stops people from working on unproductive stuff? If the company fails, you fail. This isn't the sort of case where you know, some person far off, maybe they do well or they do poorly. The success of the company is directly dependent upon you and the decisions that you make. Now, this might sound like a rather weak rejoinder, but it's working for Valve. 
it's working for Semco, it's working for Morningstar Foods, it's working for you know, WH Gore and Associates, it's working for so more and more companies all the time, and it's interesting because the suggestion there is capitalism, why should we allow people to vote if they're gonna vote for bread and circuses? Yes. Ideas of can we say that you share the ideas of Richard Tuf? Of who? Richard Tuf. I do not know who this person is, uh, so I can't answer that. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, hello. From yes. This side. Uh, do you have stats on the um, diversity and representation issues inside these companies? Because there's the possibility of building a monoculture of programmers. Uh, I don't know much about this. I know uh, Semco's done rather well in this area. There's been some questions recently about GitHub and how they actually treat people like women, particularly. That I can't tell you much about. I don't know if they're addressing that diversity concern the way we would like. I mean, obviously, it would be entirely possible for you know, a group of white supremacists to form a software company and decide that they're not gonna hire people who don't match them. Um, for those people who have rigid ideas of how things should be, I think those would be people who are less likely to adopt the feudal style corporation. Less likely to reject that, I mean. But that's just a speculation, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, those examples from US, those uh, six or seven companies that you listed, uh, my understanding is that they had this, they adopted this model uh, ever since, the, the, the ma managerless model. Can you give any examples of companies that have converted to the, from the traditional model to the managerless one? That have gone from traditional to managerless? Examples of that? Uh, Semco would be the best one. Uh, because, in, again, in the 1980s, they were a very small company producing supplies in Brazil. And Ricardo Semler simply did not like the fact that they were such you know, a rigid hierarchical organization. Uh, he actually went to, I think it was Harvard, earned his MBA there, got a very strong background in business, just didn't like what was going on, and he was the one who transformed his company. Now, he has two books that I highly recommend. Uh, one is Maverick, the other one is The Seven Day Weekend, and <clears throat> unfortunately, particularly with Maverick, the publishers forced him to cut out a lot of the failures that he had transforming the company, because he had no guidelines to this. He didn't know how it was going to work. But a lot of the success stories are in there where he explains how they managed to make the transition. Like when they still had managers, Brazil was uh, hit a recession, it was really bad. And so the employees said, well, managers take a 40% pay cut and we get votes over you know, how money in the company is spent and we will agree to take a pay cut too. Okay, and they did it. And they managed to weather a recession when a lot of other companies failed. So the employees were actually willing to sacrifice themselves so long as they saw other people sharing the burden. So democracy, profit sharing, transparency, these are three of the keys that seem to be there, though some people would say for the holacracy model that democracy is not really part of it. It's, it's kind of complicated, some of it's fuzzy. But uh, most of these companies have started out more or less managerless and tried to stay that way. So Semco's the only one I can think of right now which has transformed from old style to new style. So, any other questions? Jan. So, uh, do you think this is a trend? Is this taking off? Because I think I read about this maybe five years ago or something, and probably the examples then were pretty much the same. Maybe Medium.com is new, but otherwise... Uh, Medium and Zappos are both relatively new. Zappos, uh, Zappos has been around for a bit. Uh, Zappos is an interesting example. Uh, they recently adopted the Holacracy Constitution, but they're actually a subsidiary of Amazon which is you know, obviously you know, an unusual situation for this, but they've been such a huge cash cow for Amazon that Amazon's just, despite their very, being very famous for having a rigid internal culture, they said, Zappos, you can do what you want because you're being so successful. It does seem to be happening more and more when I'm reading about this. How much it's gonna happen, how much it's gonna continue depends upon how successful these companies are and whether or not a set of best practices can be identified which actually makes success. And the reasons for company adopting this is we see companies which are actually profitable doing this, sometimes very profitable, and some companies just because, you know, for social value, they think it's more fair. Does that mean I have uh, one minute? One more question. Yeah. Um, 
what you're talking about here is mostly high-tech companies. How, to which extent do you think this is applicable to, let's say, manufacturing companies? Where so Semco, 3,000 employees, uh, like a fifth of a billion dollars a year. They've been doing this for 25 years now. They're primarily a manufacturing company. WH Garn Associates, they produce textiles, chemicals, stuff like that, manufacturing company. Uh, Morningstar Foods, uh, they're another older one. They are a delivery company, and they produce tomatoes. And these are the older style companies. The reason there's so many tech companies, as an example, is because they seem to be accelerating the process, particularly with the adoption of Agile, and asking the question, if teams can be self-organizing, why do we need managers? By the way, the answer to the question, you know, do I recommend companies fire managers? Absolutely not. That would be stupid. Because you have all that business knowledge in their head. But how can you transform your company into other ways that they can still be productive and not have to focus on process as much? Because you don't want to lose that business knowledge. But we don't know how this transformation is going to work for everyone. So I think that was the last question. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it.